Good morning or good afternoon, depending upon your time zone. My name is Ruth Ivory Moore, Policy and Advocacy Manager for the Americas for the Global CCS Institute. We are happy to be partnering with CCS Brazil as we explore with leading experts from Brazil the rise of carbon capture and storage in Brazil. The Institute is an international think tank whose mission is to accelerate the deployment of CCS, a vital technology to tackle climate change and deliver climate neutrality. CCS Brazil will be introduced more fully later on in the session, but CCS Brazil is a nonprofit organization created with the mission of promoting cooperation between academia, government, funders, industry, and society for the development of carbon capture and storage activities in Brazil. Thanks to each of you for joining us today. We have a session that's dividing and we have a session today divided into two sessions. The first session where I'll be moderating will be dividing into looking into the regulatory perspectives in, C in Brazil for CCS. We will talk about the financing, project financing and climate justice. In the second session, we will explore challenges and opportunities for CCS in Brazil. As you know, at the recent COP27, Brazilian president-elect Luis Lula declared that Brazil is back and renewed interest in the country's vow to be a global climate leader. Additionally, we're already seeing early signs that carbon capture store will play a big role in the country's emission reduction strategy. So with that said, let's get started. Our first speaker is Rafael Moro, who will address regulatory perspectives in Brazil for CCS. Rafael, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth. Uh, it's, it's a massive pleasure to join this uh, extremely relevant uh, webinar organ, uh, organized by the Global CCS Institute. I'm uh, Rafael Moura. I am a superintendent for operational safety and environment at the ANP, at the Brazilian Regulator for Oil, Gas, and Biofuels. Uh, so basically, we are following all the, the reports from uh, IPCC, IEA, and uh, from, from many other sources. And uh, in all scenarios, uh, CCUS performs an important role in reducing emissions and uh, limiting the increase in global temperature. Uh, we are aware of uh, at least 64 projects in operation around the world, and uh, uh, we, we are following the announced capacities and uh, challenges that these projects are facing uh, abroad. Uh, of course, the United States and Europe dominate the CCUS market nowadays, uh, mainly because of the policies that are being developed in, uh, in these countries, and uh, we are well aware of that. So the first point that I would like to stress here is that, that we know that the CCS is essential for, for Brazil uh, and uh, for specific scenarios in Brazil. And uh, why is that? Because uh, it's a necessary condition for the development of the blue hydrogen industry here. <laughs> In uh, Brazil, to ensure a uh, just transition, energy security, reasonable energy prices, we will need to maximize the production of our natural ga gas reserves in the long term. So we have to put more natural gas in the market and uh, CCUS will be essential for, for us. From uh, a, a regulatory perspective, why uh, uh, regulation is so, so important? Uh, firstly, because the uncertainties in uh, regulation can be a bottleneck for the final investment decision uh, in the market. And uh, we, we know that uh, the commercial investment in CCS will occur as the regulatory bases are in place. So to reduce risks to investors uh, so that the economic models can be developed. And uh, then uh, with uh, the, the models, the projects will be uh, 
uh, will be possible to finance this, this project. So uh, we have a connection already with uh, research and development and, uh, and uh, innovation as well. So that's already taking place, for instance, in the case of the ANP, for the ones that uh, don't know, ANP has uh, in the exploration and production contracts a clause that from 0.5% uh, to 1% of the uh, gross production must be invested in uh, research, development, and, and innovation. And that's really important for the kind of development. We have nowadays around 50 million reais being invested in uh, CCUS in, in Brazil, in research projects. And uh, this is one of the tools that uh, bringing regulatory certainty can be can intensify. So we have other other possibilities as well, indirect in incentives, tax credits as well that can be used out of the scope of the the, the oil and gas regulator. But of course, establishing the basis for regulation is really relevant and really important. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we held a workshop, an internal workshop at the ANP. And uh, by the way, I want to thank Gabriel Rosenberg, uh, Yvonne Lan from Ristad for their insights. And uh, the discussion brought into light quite important information that I think that is valuable to share here for our, our discussion. 20% uh, of the CCS projects that were uh, announced uh, were canceled due to regulatory or some policy uncertainty. Uh, so one of the main points uh, was uh, the identification of who would be held accountable for or for how long the operator would be accountable when uh, for, for safety and uh, environmental monitoring. So when uh, responsibilities are unclear, it's difficult to attract investors or developers uh, to take the risk that uh, the uncertainties are, are too, too high. So there are some factors that historically had negative impact to the development of CCS, lack of funding and uh, weak economic fundamentals. So that's the importance of uh, incentive policies to encourage the development of uh, CCS. Uh, the anticipated operational discontinuation of uh, uh, other energy or carbon uh, intense energy projects such as coal-fired power plants that you need to synchronize or you need integration of uh, energy generation assets. So that's an issue as well. And uh, of course, the sensitivity to, to lower oil prices, especially in uh, exploration and productions, the uh, business models, they're based on uh, EOR. Uh, transport in uh, CCS projects uh, brings up important regulatory and uh, technical discussions as well. Uh, so the need for investments to build new, new structures or the possibility of reusing uh, current infrastructure from the oil and gas industry. Uh, this uh, possibility of uh, reuse of uh, infrastructure, uh, we have already uh, regulatory provisions for that, which is good news. And uh, regarding transportation, uh, it's important, I believe it's important to mention that our exploration and production infrastructure is aging. And uh, the design metal alloys might not be adequate to CO2 transportation due to safety issues. So uh, it might be the case that the reuse opportunity is uh, in uh, existing wells, for instance. So not necessarily only in uh, existing pipelines. So that's something that we will need to, to evaluate assets and create means to, uh, to, to develop, to create the kind of risk-based risk assessment approach or to use the ones that we have in place. Well, uh, to wrap up 
the initial 10 minute speech. Uh, in Brazil, we do have a bill regarding CCS that's running in the Congress. It went through a recent public hearing and uh, basically the bill proposes responsibilities for the Ministry of Mines and Energy or the ANP, which, which would be the regulator for the activity and uh, for a new agent as well, which is called, if I'm not wrong, the storage asset manager, uh, which the intention is to mitigate long-term monitoring risks. So uh, that's, that's the, the policy that is being discussed in the Congress. And uh, as an, uh, uh, an institution or a regulator that most likely would be responsible for implementing the policy, and we look forward to, to the discussions, we look forward to implement the CCS policy in Brazil as soon as the law is, is approved. So I think that from a general perspective, from a general regulation perspective, Ruth, that's the, the, the points that I want to bring from a regulatory, from a safety perspective, and uh, the importance of the integration of the CCS uh, activity in our our current framework in our industry, and uh, I uh, return to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Rafael. That was very helpful. It is really good to know that uh, CCS would key and helping to develop a blue hydrogen in um, in Brazil. And just like in other parts of the world, you're seeing uh, this is CCS being necessary for energy security. And also there's certainty, you need regulatory uncertainty just like we do every place else. So it's good to know to see, we're, good, we're seeing some of those same things here in the rest of the world too. And the fact that this will help to be, uh, help with the financing of projects and being able to convince investors. With that said, this leads perfectly into uh, uh, Carlos. Carlos Martins will come and give us a, his perspective on um, project financing. Um, in Brazil, where we stand there, and just give us a sense of just overall project financing. Carlos? Oh, one other thing. If we do have, if you have questions, please use the Q&A function. Uh, we will, after each one of our speakers speak, we will have a chance for Q&A. So please use the Q&A function for that. Thank you. Now, Carlos? Thanks, Ruth. I, um, well, wanted to thank uh, Global CCS for the invitation. I, uh, repeating myself, but I, I've been in the uh, carbon financing industry for the past 22 years. And, and now I'm, my mother understands what I do and I get invited to um, uh, nice events such as the one today. So thanks again for the invitation, uh, CCS, Global CCS. Uh, I wanted to uh, uh, go over some, some of the risks and opportunities that I see in financing CCS, CCS projects in Brazil. Uh, starting with the risks, uh, I guess risk number one is uh, we're entering um, a challenging environment for uh, investments in Brazil. Macro trend uh, is not clear, at least to me. We uh, don't really have visibility of uh, long-term uh, interest rates in Brazil. Um, actually, uh, uh, interest rates are rising and uh, uh, that may be a challenge, will definitely be a challenge if we're looking into um, uh, long-term financing for, for, for CCS projects uh, locally. Uh, another issue asso associated with the macro trends uh, is uh, volatility of uh, exchange rates. Uh, on the uh, revenue side, we'll talk about it uh, uh, in a bit, but uh, we may have um, uh, revenues associated or or uh, backed by by but uh, sale of carbon credits, uh, they're normally a uh, dollar or year denominated. But uh, on the um, liability side of financing, um, um, the fluctuation of exchange rate uh, will bring additional risk to um, uh, capex. Um, so that has to be factored into a. Uh, 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 investment, uh, uh, long-term investing in, in CCS in Brazil. Uh, risk number two is um, the regulatory framework. Rafael just mentioned that uh, Brazil is advancing on, on that agenda and uh, uh, I'm hopeful that uh, we will have something in place uh, for Brazil. Uh, 
um, there are issues about, uh, as Rafael just mentioned, uh, uh, mostly focused on the storage piece of, of the project. Uh, it needs to be approved. The bill uh, is now uh, being debated in con Congress. Uh, good news is that it's, it's moving, but still a challenge. Um, and I'm happy to hear that ANP, our regulator, is on top of it too. And uh, I see that uh, Brazil also uh, um, is dialoguing with other uh, countries uh, as, as far as uh, creating a framework that works uh, in connection with uh, the other regulators. Uh, um, mostly in the US and Europe. So uh, I was in, in Egypt a couple of weeks ago and I, I saw that dialogue happening. Um, so it's, it's very, uh, looks promising to me as well. But uh, okay, risk number three is the, uh, on the revenue side, uh, there is no regulatory framework for uh, either taxation, uh, incentives, uh, any sort of tax rebate as of today. They're not uh, regulation that um, establishes uh, revenues or or incentives on that side. If we rely on carbon credits uh, from the voluntary uh, market, uh, yes, there is a, a um, um, actually a very uh, uh, hot market for uh, uh, CCS uh, projects uh, with carbon financing. Um, one big issue is that uh, no methodology for the voluntary market has been fully approved that it's at a, that is adaptable to Brazil. Uh, the American Carbon Registry uh, is uh, working on uh, a methodology that is applicable to the US mostly, or North America mostly, uh, but uh, I believe we'll be able to adapt it uh, for the uh, voluntary uh, uh, mechanisms that, that are shaping up now. Um, and again, I mean, the, the, the voluntary market for uh, CCS projects is very uh, hot. So it would not be an issue for us to just um, sell the carbon forward with uh, some sort of uh, uh, risk uh, mechanism for the uh, off-taker of the credits. Um, uh, risk number four is uh, Petrobras. Uh, our oil company um, uh, is a challenge. Uh, Petrobras is a great company with great professionals, uh, but it's unlikely that anything related to oil and gas investments in Brazil would go ahead without Petrobras' uh, blessing. There's nothing wrong or unethical with that. It's just our reality. Uh, so it's something as well, uh, Petrobras has to be factoring to the uh, uh, investment uh, decision that any, anyone uh, will make to uh, develop CCS projects in Brazil. Now the um, uh, opportunities uh, uh, that I see with Brazil, uh, natural gas uh, is now all of a sudden abundant and uh, will likely be used to displace uh, fuel oil and coal in the country. So the whole uh, situation of using the resources, the natural gas resources, uh, is uh, again uh, um, an investment uh, theme that it, it is very uh, uh, in fashion, fashionable right now in the country and uh, will get attention from not only investors, but uh, regulators and uh, 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 the government of Brazil as well. And as you know, Brazil has a, a fairly developed uh, EMP industry also because of Petrobras. So uh, I think we're well positioned to, uh, to receive uh, money uh, from abroad uh, focused on uh, projects that not only displace fuel oil and coal, but also CCX associated with use of natural gas. Uh, opportunity number two, uh, Brazil is a country of sustainable biomass. Uh, which could be combined with uh, electricity projects from fossil fuels or as standalone biomass to energy uh, CCIS projects. Uh, I do research on that and I don't see any other country a better position than Brazil compared to uh, uh, when we look at the biomass, uh, sustainable biomass resources available in the country that, again, as I said, 
to be combined with uh, CCS projects. Uh, and um, opportunity number three, which is really more of a net for Brazil, uh, BNDS, the local development bank, is one of the largest development banks in the world. Uh, BNDS has been very active in promoting carbon financing for forestry, but uh, it will certainly uh, uh, be prepared to finance CCS uh, projects uh, once we have a better visibility of uh, where we want to be going forward. Um, overall, I'm, I'm bullish. I think there is a, a great opportunity for uh, uh, Brazil to position uh, itself as a, a recipient of, of money uh, for CCS projects, given again, our natural resources and uh, uh, an active uh, regulator, uh, 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 world-class uh, companies such as Petrobras and uh, a large development bank that has uh, adopted the uh, decarbonization uh, agenda. So, uh, okay, Ruth, that's what I had to say now. Thank you, thank you uh, so much, Carlos. Thanks a lot. Um, thank you for exploring a little bit, a lot, a lot more detail the challenges as relates to the liability at exchange risk um, and CapEx regulatory framework, which certainty is needed every place, on um, the rev revenue, um, and then also the, with carbon credits. And also, we will be hearing a little bit more later in the program, in the panel discussion from Petrobras itself to talk about that. Um, good to hear the, about the opportunities um, with natural gas, biomass, and also to work with the development banks. Now, we will hear from Victor Vida Martinez, Martinez Diaz. And he, we will talk a lot more about ex understanding what does it mean in a, from a justice perspective. It's important that we depend on CCS and from a regular for, for security and also for energy security and also for understanding just clarity in a regulatory regime and also financing. But we must make sure that uh, justice and inclusion of communities is equally important. So uh, Vic Vida, could you just tell us a little bit about that? Thank you. Yes, uh, no, thanks very much, uh, Ruth and uh, the C uh, Global CCS like for, for having me. And um, it's a great pleasure to talk about this by building on the, the points that were already raised by uh, both uh, Rafael and, uh, and Carlos. And I was, again, asked to focus on this climate justice angle of uh, CCS in Brazil as a developing nation. Um, and how to finance uh, such important uh, initiatives at the interface of these global and uh, local issues um, that we are dealing uh, with our world, like in this current uh, climate crisis um, here. And I will focus on, uh, similar to, to Carlos, on these um, challenges and promises that we have in Brazil and closing on the uh, BNDS, the National uh, Development Bank, was very timely, like as a hook as to where I'm going here um, and today. So let me begin by having clear what I want to say. When people talk about climate justice, uh, well, it's been well established in both uh, the literature and also in policymaking um, arenas uh, that while global north uh, countries have contributed the most to greenhouse gas emissions associated with the causes of the current climate crisis, global south nations and their inhabitants are the ones facing most of the immediate um, consequences of climate change, ranging uh, from floods to drought um, nowadays. And this unequal um, ecological exchange raises a puzzle for uh, scholars, practitioners, and, and policymakers alike, I mean, from the public to the private sector. So if countries need to mitigate and adapt to climate change, uh, one question becomes, uh, who's going to pay uh, for that and how to make this sustainable um, transition and sponsor like important initiatives like um, CCS? And Brazil is an interesting case to explore this question uh, when it comes to financing these initiatives for, for some reasons. Uh, first, uh, when it comes to the global aspect of it, uh, for instance, uh, the Inter-American Development Bank has invested in climate change mitigation and adaptation in Brazilian and Latin American cities for decades now, uh, but with a serious um, problem. 
For example, in the city of Belém, which is the largest, uh, met most populated metropolitan area of the Amazon um, nowadays and where I'm speaking from uh, today, uh, the Inter-American Development Bank has invested over uh, half a billion dollars in climate change mitigation and adaptation with limited uh, success, uh, basically because after projects are built to deal with climatic um, climate issues, um, the IDB leaves for municipal policymakers or lo other local uh, stakeholders to maintain the initiatives uh, that have been uh, constructed. And uh, local policymakers at the municipal and, uh, and state level, they rarely have the financial and institutional resources to do like adequate maintenance and like maintain like this uh, sustainability um, efforts. Um, so if the Inter-American Development Bank proudly announces that they have invested a record of $4.5 billion in climate related uh, issues, uh, one challenge becomes how to make this uh, sustainable and uh, how to make this connection between global and local uh, initiatives uh, work. Uh, one second point that makes Brazil an interesting case here to, to reflect on that is because we have this tremendous um, National Development Bank, the BNDS as the acronym uh, in Portuguese. Um, and this also touches on the current and future challenges uh, facing Brazil. So BNDS has historically disbursed more funds than the World Bank itself, uh, being this central play player in supporting uh, development and climate-related uh, projects. Um, and out of the total disbursements by uh, BNDS, according to uh, official data here, 10% uh, uh, of these disbursements were identified by the bank as green disbursements in 2010. Uh, this reached a record high of 22% in 2015 um, and 21% of green um, disbursements in 2017. However, Brazil went back to invest only 10% in these so-called green projects using BNDS funds in 2020. We literally went back uh, in time while the entire world was investing more in the so-called like sustainable green uh, transition um, that includes like carbon uh, related uh, projects and, uh, and technologies. And this raises both promises and challenges for the newly um, elected uh, government uh, in Brazil. So back in the day, the tenure of the Workers' Party uh, was marked by strengthening uh, BNDS participation in the Brazilian economy, um, including these uh, recent efforts to fund the so-called, again, uh, green initiatives by, by the bank is, itself. So if we expect uh, this to happen again starting next year, the question becomes how can the federal government maintain such efforts in preventing um, like that we stop investing in such uh, initiatives by future governments that don't necessarily embrace uh, this environmental um, agenda uh, that's becoming more and more uh, pressing all around um, the world. At the same time, it raises a question of how can we transpose the allocation of resources by BNDS to sectors of the uh, productive um, segment of the economy, to the private sector at the very local um, level. So in addition to having the possibility of financing large scale uh, projects uh, using BNDS uh, money, can we use such resources to help agribusiness uh, become more and more involved in, in these initiatives um, and um, we have uh, Claudia here who might offer better and additional details when it comes to uh, regions like Lucas do Rio Verde, Sorriso, and um, I actually have a colleague and a good friend who wrote about like conservation practices by large scale soybean uh, farmers in this area of Brazil, um, like just to use an example here. And he found that, I mean, these large scale farmers were indeed concerned with uh, new technologies that could help them save water other natural resources, um, and in parts of uh, the states of Tocantins and in Pará, uh, where I did my, my field work um, in my uh, dissertation, um, farmers themselves are proudly talking about carbon sequestration um, nowadays. And uh, if the elected uh, government uh, truly wants to make this connection between uh, investment and, and production when it comes 
either to CCS or like sustainability more broadly, uh, while counting on the participation of agribusiness um, stakeholders, uh, these stakeholders need to be involved uh, somehow. Um, and we have other state-owned enterprises that can um, start helping um, with that, which is, of course, a challenge, as Carlos uh, said, but it's part of our uh, developmental path and our regulatory and also how we finance uh, these projects in Brazil with when we have like uh, big public federal uh, government like sector with banks like the National Development Bank, Petrobras and Embrapa as being like our state owned um, enterprise um, that um, plays a role uh, when it comes to, to such um, initiatives and making these uh, federally incentivized uh, policies and, and, and money reach uh, stakeholders um, on the ground. So how best to create these synergies in, is something that there are avenues to be explored uh, moving forward while bearing in mind some of the challenges that we have uh, that are intrinsic, inherent to, to our country. So Brazil has these important and interesting channels and organizations uh, through which and by which uh, CCS uh, can be uh, developed. There are both institutional and financial resources that can be structured um, in ways that facilitate uh, such initiatives. But going back to where I started here so that I can move towards uh, the conclusion, is it just that Brazil is the one like paying this bill left uh, by Global North um, nations? How can we create like a global um, agreement and uh, global channels of investment and communication um, um, here? Uh, because if we think about countries that don't necessarily have the resources and players like uh, Brazil has, such as Petrobras and our development bank, uh, what's going to happen in these other uh, places? So Brazil has this tremendous opportunity for the next uh, year and next years to make a difference and perhaps even lead other developing nations um, in the same um, direction. The challenge uh, here relates to how to make this a legacy in the sustainable developmental path, as well as how uh, other developed countries um, can uh, build uh, this path, uh, precisely because this intensive uh, technology and other uh, issues that uh, are needed to make this uh, transition, uh, these are designed uh, and there are more policies uh, designed at uh, the global north uh, level when it comes to this climate uh, related um, initiative. So it's important to think of uh, ways to create these institutional bypasses and uh, strengthening when we have such a tremendous opportunities as, as we have here in Brazil. And I'll stop here. So thank you very much. Thank you, Vida. Thanks a lot. Um, that was very, very informational. Um, it's very interesting to see that the same problems that you're seeing there are some of the problems we're seeing, uh, challenges that we're seeing in the rest of the world. Um, and the challenge also, and I appreciate you bringing out the fact that how can we create some sort of a global agreement to start to address this and and how do we work as 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 a global community, part of the global community, in addressing um, the such things as these, where some of the developing countries, developing or do do not have those resources to address these. What I'd like to do is it still invite people if you have any Q and As related to any, either the speakers before, uh, please put those in the chat. Um, uh, we do have a few questions, and I'll start with those. The first one is, which industries are showing the most interest and support for CCS in Brazil? And I'll ask each one of our speakers to come back on. And I don't. This could probably be taken by either by by all. Be interested to hear your perspectives on that one. Which industries are showing the most interest and support for CCS in Brazil? Well, uh, sorry, I'll need the host to activate my video. It's deactivated. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. I think I think I can uh, begin uh, with uh, this one from, uh, of course, a, a limited perspective from from the the regulator to be, but I can see. Uh, the natural gas industry showing some some interest in uh, CCS projects and uh, in the the integration that I mentioned before, 
and uh, the biofuels industry as well, especially the ethanol industry. So there are some, some fast track opportunities to adopt uh, BE, CCS and uh, clean fuel policy. So such as uh, Renova Bio, you can uh, enhance the difference or in, uh, increase the difference between uh, fossil fuels and uh, renewable uh, fuels, increasing the amount of uh, uh, decarbonization credit CBOs emitted. And uh, for instance, the LCFS in uh, California as well poses some, some uh, immediate opportunities as well. So I see that the natural gas industry from uh, exploration and uh, production perspective and uh, biofuels and uh, ethanol from a uh, downstream perspective. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else want to comment? If not, then we'll go to our next question. Um, how do you define sustainable biomass resources? And it has a two part, I'll just ask that part first. How do you define sustainable biomass resources? Um, definition, there is no uh, clear cut definition, but um, um, we assume that uh, biomass that is being used in a sustainable fashion without further deforestation of uh, uh, forest. So uh, uh, for that matter, uh, ethanol, sugarcane uh, is sustainable because it's not expanding uh, its frontier outside of uh, limited uh, uh, land in Brazil. So I know it's, uh, it, there is a debate, but uh, um, a definition of sustainable is that we're not enforcing any additional piece of land today for a uh, biomass. Okay, and there was a second part to that question, Carlos, and it says, in which types of biomass-based productions do you see CCS being implemented first? Which kind of BEC project, BECCS project? Um, I think pulp and paper. Okay. Initially. First, first okay. Is okay. Thanks a lot. Next question is: Is Brazil focusing on onshore or offshore storage option, or is it mixed? I'm not sure if that's a question for Rafael. Yeah, I can I answer can. that too, Rafael. Okay. I think we're, okay. we're looking everywhere. <laughs> okay. Yes. That's, anywhere that's we can uh, store. Yeah. I mean, we, uh, we're that, just looking for space. Yes, that's that's right. And uh, uh, the, the important here is the, the economic fundamentals as well and uh, how close uh, the area is uh, to consumer markets and then to carbon intense markets. So we don't have a, a preference, let's say, since uh, we have the, the economic, economic fundamentals and uh, we have the pro proximity with the uh, consumer's market, especially the ones that are carbon intensive. Okay. And we have a few more questions. I'm not sure when we'll get to all of them. The next question is, the legal rights of underground resources is different between the US and Brazil. Brazil follows the European concept uh, that is underground resources belong to the nation. And the way we say it, it belongs to the landowner here in the States. Um, I should say belongs, yes, to the nation. And in the US is the right of the landowner. And I would just also say that the U.S. is sort of mixed too. It's not like there's one um, particular, we're struggling with poor space ownership here in the U.S. also. But anyway, how is, how is this significant different can impact CCS initiatives in Brazil? More bureaucracy, bureaucracy or what else? Essentially, it's a, it's a question of the legal rights of underground storage. How is, how is that seen in Brazil? And that could also be a justice issue, I would also assume too. Yeah, I, 
I can start, and uh, if Carlos and Rafael have uh, th things to to complement here, um, I, I would say it's uh, it's just different. Like, uh, but uh, both models have uh, have their their issues, and also like I mean, it's not like more bureaucracy or something. Because if we think in Brazil, this entails like uh, more uses of administrative law. And uh, and being ready, like I mean, to 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 become involved in in litigation in, uh, that will have uh, the participation of uh, state agents uh, somehow. But also we have like this bill that's being negotiated, like to make this very clear in terms of uh, rights and and responsibilities. But we also need to think that in the U.S., uh, this is a matter. I mean, there is this mixed uh, aspect that Ruth uh, called attention to. But when it comes like uh, to negotiations and um, perhaps even litigation between private parties, uh, the owner of uh, one piece of land, for instance, uh, by someone else, uh, the legal fees associated with uh, litigation of that, like I mean, complexity and um, and and. and and amount. I mean, the 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 financial and institutional uh, resources in in the U.S. like to to engage in a litigation of uh, of this uh, relevance. Uh, they are not different as like the amount of resources that one needs uh, to be uh, involved in Brazil. And I'll stop here. Yeah, I I uh, agree with uh, Victor. Is just different and uh, from uh, not a legal but. Um, uh, experience perspective of being uh, a, a regulator for the oil and gas industry that we face this uh, exact issue. Uh, there is no no significant difference. The problem in the, the regulatory models is basically where you allocate responsibilities and risks. So you have stable good contracts, you are you are okay. If you have that, that kind of certainty, you have the regulatory framework and the contracts and, and so on, establishing uh, each responsibility will be fine. It's, I don't see it that difference as a significant issue here, here in Brazil. Not, nothing to add on my side. Um... Okay. We do have a lot of questions. And so what we'll have to do, I'll get through maybe one or maybe two more, and then we'll have to uh, respond to those questions and get the answers back to you after the webinar. Uh, one other question is, how close is Brazil to having a carbon tax or something else that can stimulate more carbon sequestration? Um, I think carbon tax is not on the table today. Nobody's talking about uh, taxation as far as I understand. And then perhaps Rafael and, and, and Victor can uh, uh, aggregate further. but. Uh, uh, just real quick, the Renova Bill program uh, is not a taxation on on uh, producers of, of fossil fuels, but it is a mechanism that creates imbalance between fossil and and renewable uh, fuels. So it's not taxation at the end of the day, but it's it's a mechanism that transfer income to uh, producers of renewable fuels. But I don't see anything coming as far as taxation of fossil fuels. And, and the reason, again, and then I'll, I want to, Victor to comment on that is uh, once you increase taxation on fossil, you actually, the poor is paying uh, the big portion of the bill. So uh, I'm against that as well. I wasn't asked that wasn't the question. But I didn't <laughs> <laughs> well, and, okay. uh, I actually, I actually have nothing to add because uh, your closing was just, I mean, the direction I was going to take. If we talk about taxing um, these, and I mean, disproportionately the poorest sectors of uh, of of like the population, or even like I mean, private stakeholders interested in these, they are going to 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 pay this bill. So it's uh, it's important to bear that in mind when we think about. Uh, like how best uh, to gather uh, these resources and uh, would taxation be the, 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 the avenue to do that? Uh, I, I would probably say no as well. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, we've run out of time for this, this portion of the webinar, uh, but we will get take the questions and we'll get back to uh, the attendees with the answers after the post webinar. 
Now we'd like to go to our second, but we have a moderated panel um, by Natalia Weber of CCS Brazil. And in this panel, we'll explore the opportunities and challenges for CCS in Brazil. Um, and now I'd like to turn it over to Natalia. Natalia. Thank you, Bruce, and the Global CCS Institute for hosting this event. And hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today on this great webinar focused only on Brazil and its rise up towards carbon capture and storage projects development. I am Natalia Weber. I'm co-founder and director of CCS Brazil, which is a nonprofit organization for CCS deployment in our country. We work with capacity building and stakeholders engagement to strengthen the Brazilian institutional environments for the development of CCS projects at scale in the country. I'm also the vice president of Manaka CCF, which is an engineering uh, company for technical storage services and operations in Brazil. And I work as well as researcher at the Research Center for Greenhouse Gas Innovation, known as RCGI. It's a pleasure to moderate this Opportunities and Challenges panel with these three end panelists. So basically, as Rafael Carlos and Victor already mentioned, Brazil has a unique position to leverage its main economic activities to deploy CCS projects as part of the required efforts to cut CO2 emissions. And we have here representatives of the oil and gas industry and the bioethanol business which are two leading sectors in CCS projects in Brazil, as it was mentioned before. So let me now introduce them to you. We have here today Fernanda Delgado, Corporate Executive Director of ADB, which is the Brazilian Oil and Gas Institute. We also have Claudia Domingues Romero Shirozaki. Uh, she is the Sustainability Manager of FS. Uh, and we have Viviana Coelho, which is the who is the climate change executive manager, the climate management team at Petrobras. Both companies were mentioned here today. Uh, and thank you for accepting our invitation. It is an honor to share this panel with you all. I'd like just first um, to invite the audience again to write your questions over the Q and A box. I see that part of these Q and A uh, part of the questions. That was uh, that couldn't be addressed in the previous uh, in the previous panel can be addressed by our panelists now. So I'll try to uh, to use this question as, uh, as well. But please feel free to start writing your questions here. Okay, I'll read them to the panelists at the end of this session. And let's start this panel because we have so many important topics to discuss here. Right. Uh, so first, I'd like to start with you, Fernanda. Okay, um, the oil and gas industry is often one of the major drivers for CCS de deployment in the countries. How do you see the current capacities of the sector in Brazil in terms of planning, labor force, knowledge, and especially in terms of appetite for these new markets? And I'd like to hear your diagnosis on that. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you, uh, CCS, for uh, this invitation. It's very nice to be here, especially with Claudia and Viviana. Well, the oil and gas is the major driver of CCS in other countries, and may, we will see this in Brazil as well. The CCS projects existing in the world today are uh, financially feasible, and certainly the world would reach the most ambitious goals uh, of Paris Agreement uh, if we can put in place all the projects that are already uh, uh, being developed. However, we know that the speed of this implementation of this project is not is not as we would like it to be. And the main reason right now is something that we call CAPEX. <laughs> that is, it will be necessary at the right time, in the right measure, the implementation of the government incentives to unlock the new business models, as we are seeing being discussed right here in Brazil. In this context, the adoption of policies in favor of competitiveness of the domestic industry uh, 
the products demanding the markets in relation of products as in low carbon footprint this should be make CCS more uh, feasible, the projects more feasible, and this will unlock uh, those those projects and towards a low carbon economy. Well, that said, Brazil has this expertise to store CO2 uh, emission from industries that produce here in the country, adding competitive value to the projects. The country has the capacity to serve as uh, uh, CO2 uh, store storage as well. We have uh, uh, geological reservoirs, we have the expertise, we have the internal uh, demands. In other words, we have the business model that can do, uh, that can make Brazil a, a good attracted, attracted place for this, including logistics, uh, of course. Petrobras CUS program is the largest program in the world in operation and the volume re rejected uh, annually, annually is also the pioneer in the ultra dip uh, water according to the global status of CCS 2021 report. So Petrobras re-injected 7 million tons. It's about 19% of the total re-injected CO, uh, CO2 in the world. Uh, but this activity of CO2 is the, the, the something that we call uh, EOR and should keep as, as it is. But it's something that is important to mention is that the expertise to make CCS is not only in hands of the oil operators due to the technological knowledge in, in this activity and capacity and the structure of geological reservoirs in Brazil, whether offshore or onshore, but also in the industry of goods and services, service, oil and gas value chain, capable of supplying other demand in the business that is emerging in Brazil. As the ENP already said, we still have a lot of room to grow in the regulatory uh, uh, aspect and, and is still uh, much much to, to develop in the structural capacity, intelligence, but there is a very promising environment to develop CCS projects uh, here as a new business in Brazil, generating employment and avoiding excessive controls by the regulatory agents. So I will keep, I will keep here uh, from now until more uh, uh, questions. Thank you, uh, Natalia. Thank you, Fernanda. Those are really great points. Um, it's very clear for us in CCS Brazil the relevance of capacity building in this moment, especially in Brazil. We see you need to map out our major opportunities and have clear goals for CCS deployment at scale if you want to have CCS as a strategy for um, the uh, sustainable development. So, still in the oil and gas industry, Viviana. Uh, Petrobras is a relevant player in CCUS, as uh, Fernanda already mentioned, uh, but basically mostly associated with uh, oil production. And the new strategic plan uh, that uh, Petrobras just released, you announced the revision of the sustainability commitment promising to double the injection volume from 40 million tons of CO2 to 80 million tons of CO2 by 2025. Would you please tell us more about the project? What are the main actions planned and uh, what are the technological challenges you are facing? Thank you, Natalia. And uh, very nice to share this panel with you and Fernanda and Claudia. Only women in this panel. <laughs> so, so indeed, as you mentioned, we have two announcements in our strategy this year that relate to CCUS. One of them is the revision of the commitment. We, we had a commitment of uh, re-injecting 40 million tons of cumulative CO2 until 2025. And we, we are expecting we're gonna have that in 2022, so three years ahead of uh, the actual commitment. And we are now, uh, we now propose a new target, which is 80. So it's double the, the original 40 still for 2025. That is because 
uh, we we have now a few years of uh, proven uh, range action at the million scale, as as it was mentioned by Fernanda, it's the the largest project in uh, range action volume, and we have that technology on board of the new FPSOs that are coming into production. So we are we are expecting to have uh, more emissions and uh, into the the reservoirs, and the 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 new. Uh, information that also came with, with the strategy that is that the diversification committee, which studies areas for further uh, development in Petrobras, has also pointed CCUS as one of the possible areas for new businesses in Petrobras. So that would mean CCUS that is not only for our operations and for enhanced uh, oil recovery, but actually uh, developing that as uh, a potential uh, area of uh, development for Petrobras beyond our own emissions. And so that is obviously still exploratory. We, we Those are uh, studies for further uh, understanding of that opportunity. But I think those two announcements show how seriously we take CCUS into the organization. Then you asked me for technological uh, challenges uh, for that. Uh, we know that there are a number of things on the technology side to be, to be solved, both for capture in terms of costs of capture that have to be uh, brought down for that uh, technology to be as feasible as possible for society as a decarbonization strategy. We obviously have a lot of uh, uh, technological aspects on the reservoirs or the aquifers themselves that can be used for that and how can we 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 assess their safety and their uh, etc. There are also aspects into the repurposing of units, the safety of transportation. So there's an array of technology and uh, engineering to be solved for those um, aspects. But I think it's important to point out that the main constraint is, is for CCUS in the world is economical in the sense that CCUS is something at the end of the pipeline. So it adds a cost um, until until now, we don't have uses for the captured CO2 that at large and uh, worldwide can compensate for the costs like uses, like valuable uses for the CO2 that can compensate for the costs of the capture and the transportation and the, and the, and the, the, the storage. So in general, we're talking about something that requires uh, someone to pay for those emissions to be to be eliminated or it requires uh, public policies that in fact are like a decision of society to 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 subsidize let's say uh, CCUS to 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 transfer an incentive for for that in industry so I think all of the all, all of that framework has to be better studied we have to to think of the those regulations in the way that it has the least possible burden for society, because obviously uh, we are a country in which energy uh, is already very renewable. So uh, if we think about the emissions from Brazil itself that are candidates for CCUS, we're going to see a much lower proportion of emissions than other countries that have a lot of electricity or a lot of uh, industrial activities. So we do have to really think of the frameworks for, for that in Brazil. Perfect, Viviana, thank you. Uh, it's really great to hear about people, uh, Petrobras renewed ambitions towards the CUS projects. Brazil's depleted oil and gas reservoirs are really one of the most relevant opportunities we have in Brazil for 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 storage. Certainly in our course where we have the increasing production of our press results. And but sure, our our main um, struggles are really uh, related to uh, institutional, uh, our institutional framework, our incentives, as you said. Uh, but following this issue, um, we do have an important potential also for onshore local formations. 
uh, closer to stationary CO2 emitting sources in Brazil's countryside, such as the power plants, those hard to abate industries, and biogas and bioethanol producers, which is the case of uh, FPS. FS. So now, Claudia, uh, FS is also a pioneer in success in Brazil with the announcement and some advances of uh, BEGS projects. Uh, BEGS stands for Bioenergy for uh, with CCS, right? So could you tell us more about the project and its relevance for uh, FS future market position? Thank you, Natalia, for the question. And thank you. It's a pleasure to, <clears throat> to share this panel with Fernanda and with Viviana. 100% of female panel. It's uh, and with a moderator, <laughs> female moderator. It's pleasure even even higher. Uh, I can talk a little about Bex. It's our case here, and Bex. Uh, I I I'm gonna say what Peter already said about the opportunity that we have. Uh, we already have on agriculture when you talk about smart agriculture, for example. We can say that we have potential and opportunities on soil, soil carbon storage on soil, even with smart agriculture, we have the potential forest, we have a lot of potentials. And when we talk about bio, uh, bioenergy, carbon capture and storage, for example, we have the capture of the carbon on the, the beginning of the process. Uh, coming through the or sugarcane, or in our case, it's the corn, the corn already capture this, this biogenic carbon. And after the whole process and the fermentation, we are going to capture that. So we, yeah, we have an opportunity to, to have a, a biofuel, even with a, a, a negative carbon footprint. So it's a, a, a very good opportunity, not just for FS, but for the, the opportunity in Brazil. We already have a lot of plants, a biofuel plants in Brazil, and they are very concomitant. They are very close to the geological reservoir that we have, like the Parecis in our case, in Mato Grosso, but we still have the Paraná Basin uh, that has a, a very huge uh, opportunity as well because they are in the same place of the, the most amount of biofuels plants. And we, we started this project two years ago with four, with four phases. Uh, the first one was a previsibility study. And we go, went to the second phase. We carried out a detailed technical and economic feasibility analysis based on seismic studies. Uh, and in, in, we, in that, in that phase, we could narrow down the, the degree of uncertainty that we had so far by complementing on economic size. When we are talking about bioenergy carbon capture storage, we can say that we have a, a capex lower than a capex that we still, we still have to, to split the gas because our gas is 98% of CO2 emission, so we can we can dehydrate and we can make the compression of this whole gas and make the inje injection on the storage. Uh, we learned a lot on this phase two because we had a lot of indicators that we, we needed to, to see if they were feasible or not. One of them is the permeability, for example. So we are coming for we are coming to the third phase that we are going to drill a well to, uh, to have evidence that the, and to make a strat stratigraphic well to see every, the, the final permeability indicator that we should uh, need to, to emphasize that we have the, the, the right position and we have the, and we have the, the, the right position to make the, the monitoring wells, for example. So this, this third phase, it's going to be very, very, it's, like it's going to be a gate point for us, but we already know that all other criteria, we were useful on that. We had positive results in almost all aspects. Uh, and even for the porosity of the reservoir, for example. So uh, FS understands that we, the potential of the, the, the biofuels with a low carbon footprint together with uh, the, the carbon capture on the end of the, of the line, we can, we can have a, a, a carbon footprint even negative. 
and we can lead, we can make Brazil in this leadership agenda today. It's not only the banks, for example, we have all the agriculture besides of that. And we, we have all the technology, technology of, of to traceability, to make the traceability of our biomass, to make the biomass sustainable, for example. We can guarantee that it's not the forest, for example. So we have all these tools in our hands. Uh, what we need to do, it's the first point I, I would say here, it's Yes, we have a big challenge here when we talk about regulatory. This, this regulatory will unlock a lot of investments that we could do, not just FS. FS went in the, in the, the leading position to make this feasible. It's going to be, I, I think, uh, uh, it's going to be good for everyone that want to go with us, uh, after us, because yes, we to be disruptive and being the first one, we are going to, to face with a lot of challenge uh, by who is going to who is going to make the the, the well the well drilling. Uh, we are not a, a oil company, so we started to understand this whole process, this is whole activity. But we understand it's going to be a, a big a big uh, point in opportunity for Brazil and for the biofuels producers as well. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. We are really happy to see how fast this um, this FS project uh, uh, is developing. That's really good to see. And you're right, we're being the pioneers on this topic. It's the first time it's not this it injection is not related to uh, to oil and gas reservoirs. So a lot of different issues, and we are sure that uh, these uh, being in touch with stakeholders from the oil and gas industry is key to really understand the process and, and, and to make the right partnership so you can have this, uh, this project uh, in the best way it could have. So now, uh, and I'm sure that uh, the uh, agribusiness in Brazil has a huge potential for, for TCF projects as well. And, and we're going to have many New projects in the coming in the coming years being leading uh, being led by by the sector. So now, uh, Fernanda, coming back to you, uh, you have recently participated in events and technical visits to decarbonization technology projects uh, abroad. What do you notice in these uh, initiatives that can contribute to the development of CCS here in the country, here in Brazil? And in general, to the decarbonization strategies of the Brazilian oil and gas sector. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, CCS is part of the strategy of decarbonization that IBP has with all, all our associates aiming at the climate uh, neutrality until 2050. So, this exchange with other countries is very important uh, for us on this, on this theme. So we have many, many uh, uh, war groups and things that we are doing here in IBP, uh, say in institutional level, regulatory, or even uh, in our educational level in the university that we have here. So we have this willingness to promote the CCS in Brazil uh, uh, and and either being the construction of a hub, which is uh, uh, to promote the decarbonization uh, here in, in Brazil. We have been following the researches of OGCI, uh, actually, which uh, uh, talk about the potential in 56 countries, including Brazil, and they are saying about um, the storage, the, the, the storage resource management system, which can pro provide the CCS as a very good resource of uh, management of this uh, uh, oil resources, the oil resources that we have. So uh, making the long story short, the oil companies, what the oil companies, the associates associated of IBP, what they are doing uh, uh, to accelerate the CCUS in Brazil, uh, we have some of them that are 
uh, uh, working already to storage uh, 10 million tons of CC of CO2 until 2030. Uh, we have Petrobras reinjecting, as I said, and as uh, uh, Viviana said, Repsol is constructing the biggest uh, 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 factor in the world of uh, synthetic, synthetic fuels, which will have help for the capture of CO2 in their refineries. Uh, BP is also working on the carbonization of uh, the industry as well. And one thing that I always like to uh, uh, mention is on this, on this, uh, uh, on these exchanges that we participate abroad is something that we still don't have here in Brazil is the way of working in collaboration. What we have been seeing is uh, several companies and also and also banks and agencies uh, putting together, each one putting together some part of the business, some part of the chain in order to make the business to uh, 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 to be to be on on their feet. So we have to work more together to work in collaboration until the business gain scale. Until to see if it's feasible or not. Maybe it's not going to be feasible. So it's not just in CCUS, but in many other in many other um, either in hydrogen, as to say, many other uh, business new source of energies. In uh, overseas, especially in Norway, we see many companies working together, and this is something that we have to bring to Brazil. And IBP is trying to make those things happening with their associates here. And I totally uh, agree with your view of this, uh, of that we have so many different actors uh some so many key stakeholders just acting by themselves without this integration and this lack of integration was exactly the reason why we found uh CCF Brazil this is our uh basic idea to work with this integration and having these uh these panel today is, is one of our actions to do that so count with CCF Brazil uh, to, to work on this stakeholders integration. Thank you, Fernanda, very much. And uh, now, Viviana, you mentioned about, uh, about you, about, uh, sorry, Petrobras working uh, on new business, now on CCS new business, now no longer affiliating uh, operations with uh, uh, EOR. So could you explain more about what be, what would be these, these new products you are investing in and what would be the challenges uh, regarding this new this new investment? Uh, what what would be the crucial challenges you see for that now it's no longer associated uh, with EOR? No, so let's just keep the expectations at the appropriate level. What we announced is like it's a focus area for further studying. So there's no uh, commercial investment announced in terms of um, CCUS uh, beyond the, the the targets and beyond the the strategy that we already have for 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 the pre-salt fields. But we have, as I said, had a committee of executives of Petrobras that looked into different opportunities that emerge from the, from the development of the energy transition and the low carbon transition. And we have singled out three areas for more study in this year and CCUS is one of them. So that would uh, clearly align also with our participation within OGCI. So as OGCI uh, is now one of the, the most important organizers, let's say for CCUS hubs in the, in the world. And those hubs, uh, in order to have the, the best approach, they usually involve more than one actor. They usually involve emissions from different sources and different um, frameworks for that uh, to work. So we can we can leverage on our participation for OGCF in OGCI since 2018. And what we think is that Petrobras 
has clearly, and then Claudia was 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 mentioning uh, just a little while ago, like who's going to drill the drill the wells or who's going to do the subsurface monitoring, and then uh, uh, we we don't believe anyone else in Brazil can can understand better of the surface subsurface in Brazil as as Petrobras in all of these conditions, because we already do deal with CO2, we already deal with uh, wells and injection and, and transportation of gases. So clearly we have very strong competences into that. And, and that's what we're looking into it. We're looking into having this integrated approach and seeing how we can uh, develop. Uh, obviously, as I said, it requires a lot of conditions for those for those um, um, uh, hubs or those uh, businesses or the, those um, uh, opportunities to be developed because it requires the economicity for 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 the whole concept to to be possible because that right now, as we know. CCUS uh, uh, ranges depending on the condition in tens, let's say, of, uh, of dollars per, per ton of carbon that is uh, stored, depending on the situation. So it requires that the financing of that is, is, is sorted and how does it impact uh, policies. But what we, what we see is that for the development of CCUS in Brazil and, and Clearly, Brazil has reservoirs, expertise, production of biofuels, production of oil, etc. So a lot of conditions to to have to be uh, a candidate for large amounts of CCUS storage. But uh, so clearly, what we see is that Petrobras has very strong competences to be in that in that chain. Let's say. Thank you, Viviana. Thank you for sharing and. Uh... We have to speed up a little bit now. We are approaching the end of this of this panel. Thank you very much. And yes, the business model is always the biggest hurdle we have. It's not a uh, 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 only problem here. The only problem here uh, for Brazil, but uh, it's it's for CCS projects worldwide for sure. Uh, now, Claudia, I have um, a final question here for you before we go to the Q and A from the audience. So FS is leading what can become the first onshore CCS project. Being onshore means being closer to people and maybe closer to their daily routine. So the public perception can be even more relevant to your product development. What kind of questions are being made uh, to you by the public or by different stakeholders such as policy making representatives? Thank you for the question, Natalia, because it's it's a very nice question. We already made a, a plan, a risk assessment plan in the communities to understand the the the, the reach of this of the theme and the issue in the, the communities. And it's very interesting because the first question is, uh, but it's going to explode. Uh, how we can we, we can uh, mitigate. The, the fact it's not to, to if you have a, a leakage of CO2 not to explode and something that we are we are talking and we are, we are seeing it's that no one knows exactly what's a CCF project when we are, we are not, if you are not talking with, with specialists uh, they don't know what it is they think it's going to have a leakage and it's going to be we can have a, a burn or a explosion a few explosion on that so uh, to have an explosion, you have a, you need a, a, a fuel. So CO2, uh, CO2 is not a fuel, carbon uh, dioxide carbon is not a fuel, uh, and an oxidant. So it, it, the first question is, is this one. Uh, it can explode? No, it can't, because it's not a fuel. Uh, but, something it's, uh, but something regarding the, the risks of it, uh, the leakage of CO2, Yes, we, it's why we need so much regulation because in the in the regulation you're going to see all the responsibilities. Who is going to? Uh, what's the the indicators that I should monitor? That should be uh, managing to see if I'm going to have a leakage or not. Uh, how is the risk to having a leakage for that? 
So I'm going to release in the atmosphere a CO2 that I should be capturing. So this carbon that I, I, I was accounting that it would be captured, it's not capturing more. <clears throat> but risks like explosion or contamination, uh, that when we have a leakage, the contamination, it's not, uh, it, we don't have this, this risk is too, too far from a cont soil contamination or an air contamination. But for that, we have a lot of, um, we have a lot of guidelines uh, worldwide, for example, uh, for LCFS, the CARB has a, a guideline uh, from APA, the, the American uh, Environmental uh, Policy, that have this very strict, super strict indicators that you should monitor all the, the indicators of CO2 in the soil, CO2 in the atmosphere, just to, to have the, the comfort for people that it's not going to have leakage. If it's going to have leakage, leakage if the plume don't have stabilized, you should stop the operation. So there are a lot of uh, a lot of uh, guidelines and standards that we will need to, to follow. So it's very important to have uh, our one, our regulation to see who is going to have these rules, who is going to write these rules because we need to follow them. Uh, what we did in, in FS, for example, to mitigate all the all this concern from communities and everything else. We follow the most, the, the, we, think we, we study all the regulation in, in worldwide and we saw the LCFS, the CARBS one, it's someone who has all the, the, the most uh, restrict uh, monitoring indicators that we saw. So we made the project, we are, we are planning the project exactly what it's being requested worldwide to have all the monitoring and the implementation that we, that we should have. And the other thing that's very important is to, to make people understand what is it. Uh, it's not, uh, it, it's not, a, 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 it's not the, the discovery of, of the well, let's say this is not disruptive uh, technology. We already, Fernanda told that, uh, and uh, um, Viviana too, that we already know how to do that. We just need to focus on the other purpose. We need to get to, to have a, a capture of carbon to mitigate greenhouse gases. And what we want to do is that. And we have a good opportunity on that. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Very interesting to hear. Uh, in CCS Brazil, we hear uh, similar questions as well. Everybody's always worried about burying CO2. But as you said, and was also mentioned by Fernando and Viviana, it's a very safe uh, process well known and applied by oil and gas industry for decades. So it's definitely not an issue. As uh, we all are saying here in this uh, in this webinar, our major uh, struggles comes from the business models here. So here we have uh, some, some questions from the audience. There are many, many questions. I'm really sorry to not be able to, uh, to address all of them. So I'll just pick up here some that would uh, you all uh, address somehow here, so, or comment. Okay, so first start we have here is, uh, what is an attractive break even for CCS in each level? Agriculture, soil storage, concrete storage, and we're still using, we are, as we are still using concrete a lot, or geological storage, what is more profitable? I don't think uh, we have uh, we, we have an answer for that here, but we can, uh, maybe we can talk about uh, break-even costs, what would be uh, the, the best business model that you understand for your sectors, maybe uh, anybody wants to start commenting on these, on these questions and this question here. Nobody too tricky. <laughs> too tricky, this, this question. Uh, well, uh, basically, Claudia said something uh, related to uh, how the CAPEX uh, can be uh, uh, significantly lower when we have uh, these higher concentration of CO2 uh, in the stream. So, bioethanol is uh, sure something, a uh, sector with uh, lesser costs. But Viviana has he, her uh, 
hands raised, please, if you have a forehead, you can comment on that. I'll just comment that this is a very important question because overall we want to have the least possible carbon in the atmosphere at the lowest possible cost for society. So every time you're adding cost, uh, that cost will eventually end up in goods and services, uh, services for society, or it's going to be less revenue for the state. So it's a, it's an absolute fundamental thing that we are able to do things the cheapest possible, and. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to say is that how much CCUS costs depends on the framework that you're going to have. It is something that needs to be stimulated. It's not a natural business. It's not something that people are going to just make it because they are going to, it is not now something like profitable that you're regulating an economic activity. It is something that is actually being stimulated in countries because of the need for, for, for the removals. From, from the atmosphere. Now, when we're talking about CCUS, uh, we can have things from 10 to $200, depending on the arrangement of the, how much emission, where's the emission, where's the storage location, what's the infrastructure in place. So it can be, what is the concentration of the CO2 in the original gas? So you can really go from like, and whether there's a use for that CO2. Like, can I use it for enhanced oil recovery? Can I use it for something in that condition? So it's like a very wide uh, array of, of costs. And you can have cost competitive, like 10 or $15 uh, projects, but they are limited, let's say. Most of them are gonna be in the range from like 40 to $100 in terms of like how much it costs per ton of carbon for, for, for actually financing that project. Now, it also asks in the question about NBS and how much is the cost of other type of storage? It's gonna be usually in the lower end. So if you're talking about avoided deforestation, it might, it might be lower than 10. Uh, if you're talking about actual removals from planted forests or from, from mangroves, then you're probably talking about under 20 still. So, so we can see that CCUS is something that is gonna be viable for specific uses. It's not gonna be some, CCUS is not the panacea. It is, it's not like it's gonna, we're gonna sort everything else by CCUS. CCUS comes after you don't, all the energy efficiency and the, and the, and the possible changes in infrastructure and after you've done your potential for, for NCS, and then it can have a range of costs that what I can comment. And also, if I can add, and also it would be linked if you can have the carbon market added to it. So if you can do all, everything and then have the carbon market in the end of the story, so you're going to have another, another way of making all your calculations. So it has all this area of costs that Viviana was saying, and then you're going to have another total uh, different economics when you add the carbon market, uh, uh, carbon credit in the end of the story. Thank you, Viviana. Thank you, Fernanda. Great answers here. It's really important to mention all of it. Uh, I know we are running out of time. I'll just uh, make the final question here for you. Unfortunately, we have so many interesting here, but we have a, a question from Carlos Victor. How do you understand uh, should be the plan for private and public organizations to empower with knowledge the society to face said challenges? who could uh, answer this one? I, I could start, I guess. It goes on the line of what I was saying about uh, working in collaboration. It's something that we were seeing uh, overseas. I guess when the public and the private work together, uh, it's something that empower, empower, uh, uh, empowered the responses that you have to bring to the society. This is something that I always like to uh, uh, emphasize. The society has to understand what is going on. And, and when you give them the information, and one way to give them information is to spaces like this for us to discuss. And this is something that the public and the private can do together. 
Thank you, Fernanda. Uh, again, this is something CCS Brazil can help a lot, and IVB uh, does a fantastic work on this issue as well. Thank you very much. We're, we're running all, out of time here. Uh, so I'd like to thank Fernanda, Claudio, Viviana, and the audience. And of course, thank you, Global CCS Institute, for hosting this event. And Ruth, uh, I, I get back to you now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you to all of our panelists, to our speakers today. And, and again, I just want to echo what Natalia just said. Thank you to the audience and thank you for the many questions. Unfortunately, we're not able to get to all the questions, so we will be responding to the questions post the webinar. But what I want to also say, if you have a question, you want to get it to a specific speaker, please send it to info at globalccs.com. That's I-N-F-O at globalccs.com. And I just want to say again, thank you for all who were there. We learned about, we saw some things like the regular, regulatory uncertainty, energy security. We talked about the need for integration. We talked about the need for involvement of communities and making sure that this is an inclusive process. So again, I want to thank everybody for being here and um, just continue to work. And we do know that CCS is a key mitigation tool. It's not the panacea, but it is a key manage, uh, mitigation tool that has to be in the mix to make sure that we reach carbon neutrality. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot.